Let's go to Jonathan Turley, the GW Law Professor, Fox News contributor. Jonathan, what do you think of this? It's as if there's this inherent revolt going on among lenient, overly lenient uh, prosecutors. Um, where, where is this going? Well, it's an extraordinary thing, but the court basically said you're acting like a king. That's what an unchecked sovereign is, and said that's not your job. You're actually supposed to be enforcing the law, and it's incredible. I think about this moment that you had a union of prosecutors going to court, suing the district attorney for asking them to do something they considered unethical and unlawful, and then the court agreeing. So it's, it's an incredible indictment of the district attorney himself. Now, the court does say, by the way, that you do have to follow the law, but it doesn't mean you have to aggressively or passionately do so. It said that you can, you know, you cite the three strikes law, but you don't necessarily have to support it in court. And, the, and ultimately, it said the judge could disregard the law. That may not go well with some legislators who believed that they were following a public outcry uh, to impose longer sentences. You know, John, the one thing that struck out to me, uh, or stuck out to me, was the, the, the appeals court saying, we conclude the voters and the legislature created a duty that requires prosecutors to plead prior serious or violent felony convictions to ensure the alternative sentencing scheme created by the three strikes law applies to repeat offenders. If you have a district attorney, let's say not only in L.A., but elsewhere, uh, because this has popped up even in New York City, where there's the sentiment that, uh, you know, uh, it's like a turnstile. You're, you're taken in by police and let go. Uh, you're going too far. You're, you, there's one thing to give you flexibility to interpret how you best want to act, but another thing to put people in danger. Where is this going? Well, Neil, we've seen an interesting trend recently with a lot of the funding by George Soros and other groups uh, to push uh, far left prosecutors. This has not been an office that's attracted those types of campaigns. But they were enormously successful uh, that Soros and others were able to put into position uh, people like Gascon and others. Uh, but they have not really gone over well with the public after they started to basically do what they said they would do. You know, they, they are fairly hostile to a lot of these sentencing laws. Uh, they have different ideas about criminal justice. Um, and the public is reacting because we're obviously seeing increases in crime. People are not feeling safe. And now you have a court that is forced to tell the district attorney, you have to follow the law. And these prosecutors are right. What you're asking of them to do is unethical because they took an oath to not just enforce the law, uh, but to do so in letter and spirit. Gentlemen, while I have you, uh, Peter Navarro is still in this federal court in Washington. As you know, he was indicted on a contempt of Congress charges for not uh, testifying or refusing to testify before this January 6th congressional committee. For all we know, uh, this could drag on a while. He's being very blunt in there, we're told, and he th doesn't think this is fair or right, nor <laughs> his arrest at an airport uh, last night. Um, what do you make of this? Uh, you know, there are others who have been similarly uh, fingered by, uh, by this committee for refusing to testify uh, ahead of these, these opening trials or moments slated for as early as next week. What do you think? Well, the timing is very interesting because we're about to see the start of these hearings. The Democrats are putting a great deal of investment into this. They want to frame this question for the midterm elections and get through this before the House could change control in terms of parties. But Navarro took, I think, an ill-considered course here. He did not cooperate at all. And that's usually not a good option. That is, it's better to cooperate to some extent, including showing up, even if you're going to invoke the privilege. But to make matters worse for Navarro, he published a book and he has given public interviews talking about the underlying subject matter of the subpoena. So you have that disconnect of claiming privilege where you won't give the same information essentially to Congress. He would have been much better served to go to Congress and at least cooperate to the extent he's already spoken publicly about these issues. So the chances for the defense here are, are rather dim. 
Uh, and I think that it really reflects why they're pushing this case. Of all the cases, this is probably the best bet for the Justice Department. I do not understand why they did not allow for a voluntary surrender. You don't have a right to voluntary surrender, but this is not some flight risk. He was in court challenging the subpoena. I don't know why the Biden administration or the Justice Department here uh, wanted to do an in-person arrest and haul him off. Yeah, it was a little dramatic. That was going to be my next question. But I did want to finally get your thoughts on, let's say the, the Congress changes hands uh, after the midterms. Republicans take over the House, take over the Senate. Uh, all this goes away, right? I mean, the investigations, the January 6th, all of that goes away, right? But does that necessarily mean that charges against individual former Trump administration officials go away? Yeah, this is where it gets a bit wicked. You know, let's say it does switch control and the uh, Republicans effectively do, effectively do a retroactive rescission and say that we don't believe uh, that he was in contempt. We don't believe this committee was properly composed uh, and tells the Justice Department that. Does the Justice Department have to comply with that? I'm not so sure. This is a completed act, and the vote of contempt was completed by the earlier Congress. I think most people would say that if the current Congress doesn't feel that it's the victim of contempt, uh, that the uh, attorney general should yield to it, but he doesn't have to yield to it. So we could have a very weird mm. situation where Congress no longer feels it's a victim and the Department of Justice is still prosecuting its victimization. Jonathan Turley, thank you very much, Jonathan. Very good seeing you again. Again, if Peter Navarro does come out of there eventually and talks to the press, we'll take you right there. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Kilmeade. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to click to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page. This is the only way that I know for sure that you're not going to miss any great commentary, any great news bites, any great interviews coming your way on Fox. You can get it all here on YouTube. So subscribe right now.